In 2012, Marvel made history when it brought together Earth's mightiest superheroes to fight as a team in what would become an epic, action-packed, award-winning film. Think you know the whole story? Well, think again. I'm Mr. Sunday Movies from the YouTube channel of the same name, and I'm here to give you the story behind the highest grossing superhero movie of all time, The Avengers. There are almost too many heroes to handle, almost. So sit back, grab some snacks, and get ready to see Cinematica's 107 facts you should know about The Avengers. Number one, read it and weep, or cheer. The Avengers started as a comic book by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and was first released in September 1963. It was actually inspired by the success of DC Comics' Justice League. Number two, Daredevil had a part to play in the Avengers' existence. Daredevil was not complete by its deadline, so Stan Lee and Jack Kirby created the Avengers to compete with DC's Justice League. The pair brainstormed for a while, and then they came up with the Avengers. They hastily put together the first issue and sent it off to the printer, and the rest well, the rest is history. Number three, the Avengers hit shelves the same month as Uncanny X-Men 1 in 1963. And the two teams' paths have crossed plenty of times over the course of their adventures. Number four, the origin of the film came in 2005 when Marvel Studios CEO Abby Arad announced plans to partner with Merrill Lynch and release a slate of Marvel feature films under Paramount Pictures. They plan to release films that introduced and established the Marvel superheroes before merging the characters in a crossover film the Avengers. Number five, X-Men Hulk and the Incredible Hulk screenwriter Zach Penn was brought on board to write the screenplay in 2007. Number six, paving the way for movies to come, Marvel's first film, Iron Man, was a huge hit and secured distribution rights for five future Marvel films with Paramount. Consequently, Robert Downey Jr. was the first Avenger to be cast. Number seven, in 2009, Samuel L. Jackson signed on for an unprecedented nine-pictured deal with Marvel to appear as the comic book character Nick Fury, leader of S.H.I.E.L.D. Number eight, Jackson is Nick Fury thanks in part to M. Night Shyamalan. And nobody's thanked that guy in a long time. When getting ready for Avengers, Whedon had a specific vision of Nick Fury, Mr. Glass. Whedon explained that he loves Samuel L. Jackson's many acting roles from Pulp Fiction and more. But it was M. Night Shyamalan's Unbreakable that sealed the deal. Number nine, Edward Norton had played the Hulk in 2008's The Incredible Hulk and was in talks to return for the Avengers. But negotiations fell through. There were many rumors that Norton was extremely difficult to work with during the film and was ultimately replaced by Mark Ruffalo, who had been the filmmaker's original choice for Dr. Bruce Banner slash the Hulk in the first place. Number 10. After being replaced by Mark Ruffalo as the Hulk, Norton released a statement claiming that Marvel was trying to paint him in a bad light and that he declined to return because he didn't want to be associated with one character. Number 11. In 2009, Scarlett Johansson replaced Emily Blunt in portraying Natasha Romanov in Iron Man 2. Number 12. Next, Chris Hemsworth and Tom Hiddleston signed on to reprise their roles from Marvel's successful Thor film. Number 13. Soon after, Chris Evans was offered the role of Captain America in three films and the Avengers crossover film. Number 14. Captain America's shield is scratched in the film. Only diehard comic book fans would know that this would not be possible, as in the comics his shield is made of adamantium slash vibranium alloy, depending on the version, and can only be damaged on a molecular level. Number 15. Captain America actually wasn't part of the original comic book team. The team, which had dropped to four members due to the Hulk's departure, encountered a mysterious frozen man in the ocean while chasing Namor the Submariner. The frozen man turned out to be Steve, Captain America Rogers, and throwing him out, the existing Avengers team granted Captain America founding member status in place of the Hulk. Number 16. TV and film veteran Joss Whedon signed on to direct and completely rewrote Penn's screenplay. At the time, Whedon was best known for his successful TV shows, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, and Firefly. Number 17. Jeremy Renner was cast as Hawkeye, following his Academy Award nomination in the 2009 Best Picture winner, The Hurt Locker. Number 18. In 2010, the Walt Disney Studios agreed to pay Paramount at least $115 million for the worldwide distribution rights to Iron Man 3 and The Avengers, making the release of this film a bona fide event. Number 19. Although set in New York, The Big Apple doesn't deserve too much credit. In your face! The film was primarily shot in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Cleveland, Ohio. Number 20. To ensure accuracy with the science of the film, the Science and Entertainment Exchange provided consultation. They've consulted with over a thousand films and television shows. Number 21. Alison Hannigan from Joss Whedon's Buffy the Vampire Slayer recommended her How I Met Your Mother co-star Smulders 
for the part of Maria Hill. Number 22. All in the family, Hannigan's husband, Alex Denisoff, played the other in the film. Number 23. Kobe Smulders was cast as Nick Fury's sidekick, Maria Hill, rounding out the main cast. While the How I Met Your Mother co-star's recommendation helped when it came to the casting decision, Smulders was already on Whedon's radar, having been once considered for his Wonder Woman adaptation of Warner Brothers. So you know, it's no wonder she got the role. Number 24. Gwyneth Paltrow, Paul Bettany, and Stellan Skarsgård were asked to reprise their roles in the Marvel Universe. Robert Downey Jr. insisted on having Paltrow join the cast, as she was not going to originally appear. Number 25. Clark Gregg reprised his role as S.H.I.E.L.D. agent Coulson from Iron Man, Iron Man 2, and Thor. Number 26. A man of many hats, Gregg is also an accomplished director, having directed the film version of Chuck Palahniuk's cult book, Choke, in 2008. That won the special jury prize at Sundance. Next up, well Greg has been in talks to direct, you bloody guessed it, a Marvel film. Number 27. Following the film, Greg's special agent skills led him to star in Marvel's first network television show, an Avengers spin-off, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Number 28. Filming began in New Mexico in April 2011, then moved to Cleveland in August, where the city's East 9th Street was chosen as a double for New York City's 42nd Street to be used in the cinematic battle scenes. Who knew Ohio and the Big Apple had so much in common? Not me. I've never been to either of those places. Number 29. Army Reserve soldiers assigned to Columbus, Ohio based 391st Military Police Battalion provided background action during the battle scenes in Cleveland to ensure authenticity. Number 30. The NASA Plum Brook Station Space Power Facility in Sandusky, OH, was used to portray the SHIELD facility. Number 31. Although set in New York City, the film was actually shot there for a mere two days. Guess the production team decided if they can make it there, then they can also make it anywhere. Number 32. For scenes taking place in Manhattan, visual effects supervisor Jake Morrison shot aerial footage for over three days to use as background plates, stating that the main objective was to get as much aerial work in as possible for audiences to see. The big expanses, the wide establishing shots, while also making sure that the effects work doesn't look too computer generated. Number 33. Although the film was released in 3D and IMAX 3D, it was not shot in 3D. It wasn't converted until post-production. Number 34. The film contains more than 2,200 visual effects shots, completed by 14 different companies. Clearly the old, too many cooks in the kitchen, or whatever that saying is, does not apply this time. Number 35. Industrial Light and Magic was the lead vendor, and she had responsibility in creating many of the film's key effects, including the Halley Carrier, the New York Cityscape, Digital Body Doubles, Iron Man, and the Hulk. Number 36. Weta took over duties from ILM for animating Iron Man during the forest duel. Weta claimed that the most difficult part was recreating Iron Man's reflective metal surfaces. Number 37. Digital Domain created the asteroid environment where Loki encounters the other. Number 38. Iron Man was a huge hit for Marvel, therefore ensuring the Avengers film and also making Robert Downey Jr. a huge star. Downey Jr. initially pushed Whedon to make Tony Stark the lead and show the film from his perspective. They tried out a version like this, but it didn't work, so they kept the story an ensemble piece. Number 39, concept illustrator and designer of Iron Man's Mark VII armor, Phil Saunders, borrowed ideas that were proposed in Iron Man 2, as well as some ideas that were abandoned in Iron Man. He merged them together in a modular suit that has big ammo packs on the arms and a backpack. Number 40, a seasoned pro. Avengers is the third comic book adaptation Chris Evans has been a part of. He's previously acted in the Fantastic Four films, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, and The Losers, an adaptation of the DC Comics, The Losers. He also voiced Casey Jones in the 2007 animated Ninja Turtles film. Number 41, Mark Ruffalo physically plays the Hulk in the film, unlike the other Hulk films where an actor portrayed Banner, but the Hulk was a CGI recreation. Ruffalo played him using Avatar-inspired motion capture suits and performed all the Hulk's physical actions. They also captured his facial movements and based the Hulk's appearance on Ruffalo's. This is also the first time they've included body hair on the Hulk. Number 42. To create the Hulk's voice, it wasn't all Ruffalo. The actor's voice was blended with those of Lou Ferrigno, who is the original Hulk from the 1970s TV series, and sound designer Chris Boyes. Number 43. Scarlett Johansson trained for weeks in hand-to-hand -hand combat and weapons training with her stunt team to play Black Widow. She also performed some of her own stunts when Whedon would let her. Number 44. Jeremy Renner trained with 87-11 stunt team fight coordinators to prepare him for the role as Hawkeye. He wound up working on four straight films with them. Mission Impossible 4, 
Hansel and Gretel, Avengers, and The Bourne Legacy, culminating in two years of training. He also trained with Olympic archers. Basically, he's proven himself game and fit for anything. Number 45, Jeremy Renner tore a muscle in his back during filming shutting down production for days. Number 46, evil from the start. In the comics, Loki is one of the primary and recurring villains that the Avengers face. In fact, he was the villain in the very first issue of the comic book. Number 47, although Renner is left-handed, Clint Barton, Hawkeye, is an ambidextrous archer. Renner is seen shooting right-handed in Thor and both left-handed and right-handed in this film. Number 48, Whedon initially didn't believe that Loki could provide enough trouble for the group, but the studio rejected his idea to add another foe. He later credited Tom Hiddleston's ability to throw himself into the role and called the actor an amazing mimic. Number 49, the security guard who asks Bruce Banner if he's an alien is played by legendary character actor Harry Dean Stanton, perhaps best known for his role in Alien. The cinematographer was working on a documentary about the actor, Harry Dean Stanton, partly fiction and suggested his cameo. Thrilled, Whedon actually wrote a 12-page scene for Ruffalo and Stanton, but very little remains in the finished film. But it does include the line, are you an alien? Number 50, early drafts of the script featured Wasp, AKA Janet Van Dyne, one of the original comic book Avengers. There was a very waspy draft that I wrote, but it was way too waspy because I was like, she's adorable. I'm just gonna write her. Whedon thought that he might not be able to get Scarlett Johansson's Black Widow to participate, but he did. And the Wasp draft was out and never to be heard from again. Number 51. When Coulson leaves Stark Towers, he also leaves behind several files for Stark to study relating to the destruction of Project Pegasus. If you look very closely, you can see that one of the files is slapped with the designation 42. This is a reference to Marvel's infamous hero versus hero comic throwdown, Civil War, which saw Iron Man help develop an extra dimensional prison for captured bad guys and rebellious heroes called Project 42. The project became necessary because the old housing facility, Project Pegasus, had been destroyed. Number 52. Additional filming was needed for the scene where Nick Fury meets the World Council. We didn't wanted members to appear ominous and big, but the way he filmed them, well, you know, they looked more like more like weather people. Number 53. The only scene that stayed exactly the same as written in the script is the one with Black Widow being interrogated. Having studied Russian literature and language when he was in school, Whedon said he really enjoyed writing the tie to the chair scene he thought up early in his career and was finally able to put to use. The floor around the chair was padded, so Scarlet and her stunt double, Heidi Moneymaker, could do what they needed. Number 54. The Halley Carrier on the ocean was actually filmed on a runway in the Albuquerque desert. It was literally too hot to handle. Described as so hot that weed and sneakers melted on the tarmac. He was quoted as saying, it was a nightmare. Everyone was baking. The chilly air around us is a tribute to ILM's work. Number 55. Originally, the opening of the Avengers would have Captain America stumble outside and discover that he was on a shield Halley carrier floating in the sky over New York City. Whedon decided that it would be more dramatic to do the takeoff from the water. The concept artists had designed the wings of the carrier to flush at the flight deck level, which means you would see them as soon as you see the carrier. Whedon wanted the wings hidden underwater. This proved difficult for concept artists creating it. CA Nathan Schroeder has stated, we had to come up with some way that the wings could would actually move. They kind of climbed up and down the side of the ship. So they start underwater, and if you pay real close attention, they kind of elevate upwards and then lock into final position. If you see the original, when it's in the water, you can see there's a bit of folded pieces where the wing is. And if you look at the underside of the Halley Carrier, you can see I put in some tracks on the front wings and back wings to suggest that's how it rides up and down. Number 56. The film's second unit shot a chase sequence in Worthington, Pennsylvania, a Creekside Mushroom LTD, former home to the world famous Moonlight brand mushrooms. Creekside was the world's largest mushroom growing facility and the only underground mushroom farm in the United States. For the production, shooting at the facility meant gaining access to the 150 miles of tunnels 30 feet below the ground. Prepping the tunnels for the chase sequences without power took months. Now that doesn't sound very fun guy. You get it because fun, fun and funky. It's a, it's a play on words. It's pretty good. Number 57. With so many fight sequences in the film, many of the actors trained in different fighting styles, including medieval fighting techniques, wushu, kung fu, and Kali. Number 58. Another challenge for the production design team was transforming Cleveland's historic public square into an exterior location that would double for Stuttgart, Germany. The production team changed English words on the buildings to German and added a beer garten to the square. Local workers in the area loved the changes and hoped that the upgrades, new flowers, plants, picnic tables and lampposts would stay in place after filming was completed. Sadly, 
they did. Number 59. In order for special effects to pull off the destruction of New York City, special effects supervisor Dan Sudik rigged up precision pyrotechnics with well-timed car gags so that the assigned stuntmen and women could safely maneuver the explosions and flipping cars. Sudik and his team rigged 28 explosions, which went off in a wave fashion down the street to simulate an air attack. The sequence also included setting up 14 cars down the middle of the street. These vehicles included cannon cars, flipper cars, pyro cars, as well as a semi-truck that exploded. Sudik and his team pulled off the sequence without a hitch. Massive props. Number 60. One of the hardest shots of the film was when Hulk punches Thor. It was captured as one long continuous shot. For the actual punch, they put Chris Hemsworth in front of a blue screen, standing on top of a real section of a downed leviathan that they'd built. They attached Hemsworth to a cable that they re-timed, so it could look like that he was knocked sideways. They then cut a few frames out of the footage, so it looked like the Hulk's punch has instant impact. Number 61. During the hangar fight sequence between Thor and Hulk, one particularly powerful hammer strike sends the green monster stumbling backwards, crippling a fighter plane used to break his fall. If that plane looks familiar, that's because it's the same one used in James Cameron's True Lies. Whedon claims we got that one for cheap. Number 62. Seeing double? Every single Avenger has a CGI copy. They got tons of high quality scans for every actor, so they could create really high quality digital versions. They also captured every possible facial expression from these actors using the Nova camera system. In some scenes where Black Widow was involved in mostly CGI action, they were able to substitute the CGI version of Black Widow. Number 63, the Chitari armor was originally gonna be a lot more golden. In the early days, the gold armor looked very cool, menacing against the pale skin. But once rendered in CG, it looked way too Vegas? It started to look decorative, says associate VFX supervisor Jason Smith. It was altered to look more bronze rather than gold. Ditto with the Leviathan, which the designers called Jumbo internally. He was originally a lot more blinged out, making him appear a lot more fake. They ended up dirtying up the alien a lot more to remove the extreme brightness of the goal. Number 64. The fight scene where Iron Man and Loki have a stare down with their retrospective armies was a nod to spaghetti westerns, especially those starring Clint Eastwood. Whedon actually cut the scene together with the Neo Morricone's Once Upon a Time in the West theme before replacing it with the Avengers score. Number 65. The big scene where all the Avengers are fighting and the camera hands around, showing each of them fighting different aliens, required some last minute tweaks. Whedon decided that instead of fighting alone, Captain America should be helping Iron Man. As a result, they cut Captain America out of his original location and put a digital double cap next to Iron Man. Number 66, during the big fight scene at the end of the film, Hawkeye and Black Widow find themselves fighting back to back against an overwhelming number of enemies. Instead of being worried though, they take the time to reminisce about a previous mission in Budapest. Earlier in the film, a clip on a monitor on the shield helicarrier of the pair duking it out with a legion of unseen assailants bears a strong resemblance to their climactic battle. Fans theorize the clip being played is what the characters are referencing. Number 67. When Thor uses Molnir to create a storm cloud, the moment is actually made up of stock footage. They were going to create a huge simulation of the storm over Thor's head, but in the end they wound up buying a stock clip of storm clouds forming a circle. The shot ended up being so brief that it was not worth creating CGI clouds for. Number 68. After Thor takes Loki off the Quinn jet down to the mountainside, two ravens fly by as they're talking. In Norse mythology, their father Odin has two ravens, Hugin and Munin, who would bring Odin information from Midgard or Earth. Number 69, after Loki is brought on board the helicarrier, Tony Stark can be spotted wearing a Black Sabbath t-shirt. The band Black Sabbath is well known for their song Iron Man. Although the song was not originally associated with the Marvel Comics character, it has since been referenced in the comics, including at the end of Iron Man when Tony Stark quotes the lyrics, I am Iron Man. Number 70. Before capturing Mark Ruffalo's performance as the Hulk, they had a makeup artist gussy him up, which in a character like the Hulk's case, meant adding attachments to Ruffalo's cheeks and brow to make them more Hulk-shaped. They then added what's called a digital prosthetic to enhance those features. Number 71. The original body that they used to create the Hulk's design was that of Long Island bodybuilder Steve Rom. He was painted green and shot with a special camera so you could see every nuance of how his muscles bounce and flex. Two of them became one when they put Ruffalo's head on Rom's Hulk body. Number 72. Rom's honest reason for getting into bodybuilding was always his dream to play the Hulk. Rom's grandfather even knew Lou Ferrigno, the original Hulk, from when they were both sheet metal workers in Brooklyn. Small world. Number 73. For the scene where Bruce turns into the Hulk and chases Black Widow on the helicarrier, they first experimented by doing some mocap footage with an athlete in a mocap suit. Joss Whedon claimed that it looked too human 
and too much like a real sprinter running, so they had to scrap it. We didn't want something more flexible and also more out of control. Number 74, when the Hulk is smashing Loki up and down, they inserted Tom Hiddleston's real agonized face. Animation director Mark Chu says, I had to get behind Tom Hiddleston and shake him violently so they could capture his real expressions. Number 75, according to Chu, they studied simian motions for the Hulk. And when Mark Ruffalo came to the studio to experiment with different motions in the mocap suit, he started to tend to go towards more apish motions, giving him that animalistic quality that gives you the feel that he's not quite in control. Number 76, they also debated how high the Hulk can jump. In the comics, the Hulk can jump for miles, but the makers of the Avengers wanted to keep him more realistic and create the feeling that he had real mass. So they decided that he can jump to the tops of buildings, but not miles and miles away. Number 77, Robert Downey Jr. didn't wear the painful, pinchy suit much during filming. After the first Iron Man film, Downey Jr. saw what could be done with the CGI suit. So when you see the Iron Man suit in the film, it's CGI. There's a partial version called the football suit that he wears in a couple of scenes, such as at the end where he's laying on the ground. Number 78, in one of the most memorable bits of dialogue from the movie, Banner says that he tried to kill himself, but the other guy spat the bullet out. That's actually a reference to a scene that was filmed and then cut from Norton's 2008 film, The Incredible Hulk. The scene can be found on the DVD extras of The Incredible Hulk. Number 79, Robert Downey Jr. kept food hidden all over the lab set. Nobody could find where it was from. So they just let him continue doing it. In the movie, that's his actual food he's offering. And the moments where he was eating was not scripted. Downey Jr. was just hungry and enjoyed keeping his co-stars on their toes. Number 80. Chris Evans was unsure about his line, I understand that reference. He feared that audiences would think Cap is unintelligent. However, when they watched it in the presence of audiences, he was relieved to see the crowd found it hilarious. Number 81. Although Kobe Smulders' character Maria Hill doesn't do much fighting in the film, she wanted to appear like she was able to. Even though she wasn't offered a trainer for the film, she got her own Black Ops trainer to train her. That's some serious dedication. Number 82. Avengers creator Stan Lee continues his tradition of popping up in small cameos in all of the Marvel films. Well, most of them. You can spot him in the movie as the man in a newsreel talking about superheroes living among us. Number 83. In June 2011, Avengers stuntman Jeremy Fitzgerald injured his head attempting a stunt involving a 30-foot fall from a building after getting hit by an arrow. Sounds like an extremely terrifying, freaky, close call. Because it was. But you know, thankfully, he survived. Number 84. In May 2012, Whedon said that it was his decision to include Thanos in a post credit scene, even though the character is not identified in the film. He said, he for me is the most powerful and fascinating Marvel villain. Number 85. Originally when Iron Man awakes from falling from the sky, he was going to say, what's next? Robert Downey Jr. thought it could be more interesting, so he improvised a line about going to a shawarma restaurant. Exactly one day after the film would premiere, an additional coda involving the Avengers eating shawarma was shot and placed at the very end of the credits. Number 86. The result? Shawarma sales reportedly skyrocketed in Los Angeles, St. Louis, and Boston in the days following the film's release. Number 87, Disney and Sony Pictures agreed for Oscorp Towers from The Amazing Spider-Man to be included in the film, but the idea was dropped because too much of the skyline had already been completed. Number 88, a little music to Captain America fan is in November 2011, because Marvel announced that Alan Silvestri, who scored Captain America the First Avenger, would write and compose the score for the Avengers. Number 89, Sylvester developed the score with the London Symphony Orchestra at Abbey Road Studios in London, England. Number 90, Abbey Road has a rich musical history, known for being the studio that many classic Beatles and Pink Floyd albums were recorded. The score for The Empire Strikes Back was also recorded there. Number 91, July 2011, a teaser trailer that was meant to be a post credit scene for Captain America the First Avenger was briefly leaked online. Entertainment Weekly speculated that it came from a preview screening and described the footage as shaky, fuzzy, flickering, and obviously filmed on a cell phone. Number 92, with so many eager, loyal fans, the Avengers script was under tight security and often referred to by the code name Group hug. Number 93, but they could only keep it under wraps for so long. At one point, the film script was stolen and leaked online. The reported source? Ironically, none other than Head of S.H.I.E.L.D. himself, Samuel L. Jackson. He'd used a printer in Canada, and a digital copy of the script was left behind. Number 94, the cast was close off screen. The famous battle cry in the comic book, Avengers Assemble, is a call to arms for members of the team to fight the foes that no single superhero 
can withstand. During production, Chris Evans would send out text messages to the cast to come together for a night on the town in Albuquerque after a long hard week of work. Evans would text, assemble. Number 95, one of the final scenes shot with the Avengers, the one of the very few shot in actual New York City, was the scene in Central Park at the Bethesda Fountain. It was shot on the Labor Day weekend, resulting in thousands of onlookers and lots of paparazzi gathered around to watch filming and causing quite the stir. Number 96, the Avengers was released on May 4th, 2012 and instantly broke the record for the biggest opening weekend ever, grossing over $207 million. The previous record was held by Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2. Number 97, sadly, the Avengers did not hold the record for too long. It was broken three years later by Jurassic World, which was then again broken by Star Wars The Force Awakens. Number 98, the Avengers broke several box office records on its way to grossing $623.4 million in North America and $895.2 million in other countries for a worldwide total of $1.518 billion. It became the first Marvel film to make a billion dollars. Number 99, The Avengers is officially the highest grossing superhero movie of all time. Number 100, the film opened to favorable reviews, with critics praising Whedon's direction, storytelling, and the cast performances, especially Mark Ruffalo's take on Bruce Banner slash The Hulk. It's got a 92% approval rating. The website's consensus reads, thanks to a script that emphasizes its hero's humanity and a wealth of super-powered set pieces, The Avengers lives up to the hype and raises the bar for Marvel at the movies. Number 101, though The Avengers was nominated for the Oscar and BAFTA awards for best visual effects, it lost both to Ang Lee's Life of Pi. Number 102, the film won big at the Saturn Awards, taking home awards for four out of its six nominations, including best sci-fi film of the year. Number 103, naturally a sequel was planned for release in 2015, with the Avengers set to return. It would also include the characters of Quicksilver, Scarlet Witch, Vision, and mega villain Megatron. I mean Ultron. Number 104, with Bettany joining the cast as Vision, he actually has two separate roles in the franchise. Also credited for voicing Jarvis, Tony Stark's AI butler. Number 105, between the two Avengers films, Marvel released Iron Man 3, Thor The Dark World, Captain America The Winter Soldier, and Guardians of the Galaxy. All were box office hits, and Iron Man 3 had a cameo from Bruce Banner in a post credit scene. Thor The Dark World has a Captain America cameo when Loki transforms into him to taunt Thor. Number 106, when released on DVD and digital outlets in September 2012, the film once again broke records, topping the Nielsen Video Scan First Alert chart, which tracks overall disc sales, as well as the dedicated Blu-ray disc sales chart, with 72% of unit sales coming from Blu-ray, a record for a new release, in which both the DVD and Blu-ray formats were released simultaneously. Finally, number 107. According to director Joss Whedon, the original cut of the movie was over three hours long. About 30 minutes of the exercised footage were included on the Blu-ray, most of which revolve around Steve Rogers, Captain America, struggling to adjust to the modern world. Chris Evans announced that those deleted scenes would be used in Captain America, The Winter Soldier. Thanks for watching Cinematica's 107 Facts You Should Know About The Avengers. I've been Mr. Sunday Movies, and you can check out some of the videos I've made over at my channel, including one on the deleted scenes from Star Wars The Force Awakens. But did you like what you saw here? We've got more 107 Facts coming out next week. And if you love obsessing over movies and TV, be sure to tell your friends, or even your enemies. Maybe you can make them a friend. So why not like and subscribe to Cinematica, where we help you watch smarter. Or they do, I'm just like the voice for, for, the, for this video. Okay, I'm going. Goodbye.